Okay. Good morning, church. Um, let's um, begin our service with prayer this morning. Lord God, we um, thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to, um, to experience your word and knowing, God, that uh, through your word we're experiencing your heart. Father, your heart for us, your love for us, your desire, God, to bring us into a place of blessing, Father. So, Father, we pray that you would just open up our hearts this morning. Father, we are mindful of those who are hurting this morning. Father, in the midst of this uh, pandemic, Father, uh, Father, those who um, are sick and just uh, need your touch. And Father, we pray your Holy Spirit would just uh, fall upon your people as a testimony, God, to uh, uh, what, uh, what you can do and what you desire to do, Father, in the hearts and in the minds, Father, of, of those um, whom you love, Father. And we um, know, Father, that uh, your love for us is great as it is for, for the, uh, the entire world. And that's the reason for your Son, our Savior. And so we celebrate this uh, Christmas time, Father, um, the gift of, uh, of Jesus Christ, Father, the gift of, of salvation. Um, Father, the gift that uh, truly um, is eternal. So God, uh, again, meet us here. Bless your churches um, in this church as we, uh, Father, consider what, what you would say to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to ask that you turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation. And this morning, we're going to uh, pick it up in chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, this morning, the Lord, we're going to consider what the Lord would say to uh, the church in Sardis, starting in verse 1, to the angel, again, Jesus is dictating to John, to the angel of the church in Sardis. These things, says he, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Lord says, I know your works. That you have a name that you are alive, but you're dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you've received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will, know, you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Literally, what the church, what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So, again, to uh, get our bearings this morning, today we are uh, partaking of the fifth course of a seven course meal, you know, where there is laid out before us the history uh, of the church throughout uh, the entire church age, right? Today we're studying the fifth of the seven letters that Jesus wrote to the seven churches in Asia. And as we've seen these two chapters, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, they represent that second division 
of the book of Revelation, as we know, because Jesus said to John in chapter 1, verse 19, what did he say? He said, write down these, uh, write down the things which you have seen, referring to the chapter 1 vision, the things which are referring to the things that we're now studying, the things concerning the church, and thirdly, the things which will take place after these things, referring to that time following the rapture of the church. And so we're now in the second division of the book. Again, the things which are. And again, you know, how are we supposed to take these letters? I think it's important to kind of rehearse, you know, um, how um, these letters are, are, are to be considered, you know, because they really speak to us on three different levels, on the historic level, you know, as, as we've seen, as applied to that specific church that, that was in existence in that particular point in time right there. there. It was written to a real church, a real church, a real historic, historic church, church in the first century. But then the Lord would have us consider this because of the cues he's giving, given us, that, um, that this is meant to be considered on a corporate level, a meaning that they apply to all the, the whole church throughout the church age because uh, there are seven letters and seven represent what? We know that seven represent the number of completion or the n- number of f- uh, fullness. And so these, these letters are applicable to the church throughout all, all, all time, in a sense, they're the seven same churches that, that are in existence, that exist simultaneously, you know? And I had a brother ask me, uh, what, what's the application, uh, you know, what would the church in Dixon be committed for? And, and what would the church in Dixon be rebuked for? And, and um, I believe there are elements out of every one of these letters, every one of these letters have application to Calvary Chapel of Dixon or, uh, or I, I believe that's the purpose that the Holy Spirit gave these, um, or given th- us these letters. It's because they are applicable. They apply to us today. And so... We're to humble our hearts and consider what the Lord would say to us as his church today. And this takes us to the, that, that third application, that personal application, that application on a personal level, speaking to those issues that confront me in the quietness of my heart and you in your heart and we in our hearts. Not, not only does each letter apply to each individual, but each letter applies to each of us you know, as individuals. But it's also important to note that there is a flow, a flow um, throughout history that amazingly parallels what Jesus lays out for us, again, in chapters two and three, in the flow of issues. The flow of issues, what Jesus addresses in each church is seen specifically in, in church history. You know, it's, it, it, it's interesting to note that if presented in any other order, that it simply wouldn't match up with, with what history bears out. And, and, and so there is a, a, a historical uh, application, which, um, which is important. You know, we saw from the church in Ephesus, the church there had lost its deal, its, its passion, its, its first love. And, and, um, and that was uh, specifically addressing the church after Jesus had resurrected to about 100 AD, uh, about the time of this uh, writing, where the church, the passion for the things of God were cooling off. And then that was followed by the church in Smyrna. And we saw that from that time, 100 AD, to about the, uh, 300 AD until the time of Constantine, where the church was just experienced this unprecedented persecution. Six million Christians martyred for, for their faith. And, and then with Constantine, you know, we saw the church in Pergamus, you know, that compromised, that mixed marriage where the church 
you know, first began to compromise, and that, that took place for, for 300 years. And from there, um, as we saw last week to the church in Thyatira, that parallels the church from what we consider the Middle Ages, from about 600 A.D. to 1500 A.D., that time of medieval Catholicism where compromise gives way to outright crush, corruption. And this morning we now move to the church in Sardis. Sardis, Sardis historically was um, a very wealthy city. You know, it was located on this, uh, this uh, on the convergence of, of several trade routes. Uh, it was located most notably on this royal highway, highway linking Ephesus and Pergamus and Samar Smyrna to the rest of uh, Asia Minor. Um, and it was just about 30 miles southwest of, of Thyatira. The town itself was located on, on a bluff, uh, on a bluff on top of this Mount Tumulus, um, uh, above this valley, right? And, and because of where it was situated, um, it was easily defended um, from invading armies since there was only one way in, into the city. Um, the other three sides of the city were, um, were framed with these steep cliffs um, uh, that, uh, that dropped to the uh, valley below, uh, below. And so there was a sense, and the Lord is using this, you know, why did he uh, choose this church in Sardis to address these issues? Well, because there was application and there was historic application, you know, because with this church of uh, Sardis, where it was located, there was a sense of in invincibility, you know, that they had this unrivaled, you know, strategic I I advantage based upon, you know, the way the city was laid out. They felt you know, they only had to guard one side of the city and they practically left the other three sides un unprotected um, since, you know, it, it would have taken a mountain climber, you know, to, to scale uh, those cliffs. About 600 years uh, before this letter was written, Sardis, it was considered one of the greatest cities in the entire world, right? It was the ancient ancient city um, of the Lydian Empire, you know, that began around 1200 BC. The prophet Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 27, he mentions these Lydians about 580 uh, BC. He mentions them as, as men of war and, and of, of as mercenaries that as mercenaries that fought to defend Tyre. Tyre was the capital of the Phoenician Empire, today located in, in, in southern Lebanon. But at the height of its strength, there was a king, a celebrated king, and his name was Croesus. And he um, ruled about 26 years, from 560 to 546 BC. And he was known as a king of great wealth. In, in 549 BC, Croesus began um, hearing of this up and coming empire and this up and coming army, the, um, the, the Persian army, and how they were uh, steadily growing stronger and stronger and more influential. And, and uh, how with that, they were becoming more and more a threat. So um, this King Croesus, he decided, um, as history bears out, to, to consult a seer or a, a, a diviner um, uh, in, in Greece at Delphi. And that uh, diviner gave him some advice, which turned out to be bad advice. Don't you just hate bad advice? Well, that's exactly what, uh, what he got. The seer told him that if you cross the Halley's River, you will destroy a great empire. And with that information on that advice, King Croesus, he went to war, uh, hoping to uh, keep the Persians at bay. But instead, uh, he was um, uh, handily defeated. And so what he did, he quickly retreated back to Sardis. And, and soon thereafter, the Persian army followed, right? And, and when King um, 
uh, Cyrus, or Cyrus the Great, King of Persia, um, uh, arrived uh, and was unable to uh, penetrate these uh, defenses, these Sardian defenses, he offered a reward um, to any soldier who could figure out how, how to um, how to invade Sardis. And one man, uh, his name was uh, Hydrogenes, um, he was watching from the, the bluffs below. And he noticed there that there was a soldier, uh, uh, a Sardinian soldier, who actually dropped his helmet. This is a, a, a historic account. He actually dropped his helmet um, and it just bounced down um, the bluff and it was wedged uh, about halfway up. But that soldier waited until the cover of darkness to descend that, uh, those bluffs. And um, the, um, the uh, soldier, uh, Hydrogenes, who was uh, watching this all take place, he took note. And that very night, he led a, um, uh, a cohort of, of troops uh, up uh, into the city and, and took it uh, handily. And, and so that very night, Sardis fell. And uh, seven years later, interesting, uh, you know, I, I love this history, that, uh, that uh, Cyrus the Great, he captured Babylon uh, and allowed the Jews to, to return home as was prophesied by Jer Jeremiah. And we saw fulfillment of that in the book of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Well, about 335 years later, in 214 BC, those same cliffs were climbed and, and, the, and conquered by another general, um, Antiochus, Antiochus the Great, one of the, the uh, generals of, uh, of Alexander the Great, and who succeeded him, or succeeded him as the, uh, the uh, Grecian Empire was split amongst those four generals, and he um, took um, this, this same um, city. So, um, you know, the, the, the city at this point was just a shadow of what it had been in its glory days. History tells us that the church in Sardis uh, lasted until the late 9th century AD, but um, few, if any, Christians remain there in Sardis after that. And so, um, y'all can wake up now. I, I, I'm done with that history. But Sardis, uh, all of this to say that Sardis was a has-been city. It was uh, a city that was living off of its past glories. And because of that, it, it, it serves as one of the great history lessons of all time. Uh, and that history lesson is not being overconfident because uh, pride, you know, uh, comes before the fall. And that same word was, uh, in that same history, uh, was being assumed um, by the church. So prophetically, this speaks to that time in church history and, and the years following the, um, what the God did in the Protestant Reformation in the years following that great outpouring of God's Holy Spirit on men like uh, Luther and, and Calvin and Knox, you know, men that God used um, to breathe new life into his church. But what happened? Well, history tells us what happened, you know, what happened following those in those su succeeding years that the fire of the Reformation, the, of the flame of, of, of what God had accomplished. It just kind of petered out. And, and yet, uh, much of the church didn't notice. They were still resting on what was and, and not what was um, the current situation, what is. In other words, they were blind to, uh, to their uh, present spiritual condition. And so like the city of Sardis, they were um, asleep at the wheel, right? While their spiritual well-being was, was, was being ransacked. And, and, and so that's the problem, but what's the solution? Well, in verse 1, Jesus points them back to what? The person and the work of God's Holy Spirit. He says, these things, says he who has the seven spirits of God and 
the seven stars. So here again, we see what? We see, you know, the Lord himself drawing upon that imagery of, of chapter one, and uh, specifically uh, that uh, vision of Jesus in, in verse four of chapter one, where Jesus himself illuminates what? He illuminates the fullness. He illuminates the completeness of, of all that God is and God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who, by the way, Jesus refers to here as the seven spirits of God. And why we ask, again, seven is the number of completion, right? Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, he refers to the seven ministries, the seven aspects of what the Holy Spirit does. He comes in strength and in power and in, um, in every way that we need him to come. And he is the seven spirits, you know, pointing to us the fact that, that God's Holy Spirit is what is needed. God's Holy Spirit is what we need is what we need here and now in, the, in this day and the age in, now which, in which we're now living. Um, and, and so we see here the enabling presence, the enabling presence of God's Holy Spirit is just waiting in the wings, right? Waiting to infuse into what? The seven stars, which is a representation of what? What do the seven stars represent? As we saw in chapter one, the seven stars represent the seven churches. And so the seven spirits of God waiting to infuse into the seven churches his life-giving power, his life-enabling power. And yet Jesus says to the, to the church in Sardis, he says, I know your works. And, and that's noteworthy because the, the uh, church in Sardis was a working church by all indication. They had it going on, right? He says, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. You know, it, it, I just think that, uh, that we would be doing an injustice to what the Lord's saying here if we looked at this as just a piece of history. Because this applies to us today. The Lord says, I know your works, but that you have, that you have a name that you're alive. But you are dead, right? Um, we all face this possibility, you know, that we would just be working it out, you know, that we, you know, would have the appearances of a happening church, you know, we verse by verse teaching and orthodox teaching a rocking you know awesome uh, praise band you know a great children's ministry you know great you know youth ministry you know we got things going on and yet what you know even though there's a lot of activity we can be stone cold we can be stardust you know they themselves have the reputation of <laughs> being alive but in reality, they're, they were anything but, right? They were anything but alive. And so what this essentially boils down to is what? The, all of this boils down, what this is, is essentially a study of the place, the rightful place of God's Holy Spirit in the church. If life goes out of the body, what do you have left, right? Yeah, you have a corpse. What we often hear in news reports of, uh, you know, bodies being found and, and, and they're referred to as the remains. The remains were found in Golden Gate Park or this or that, you know. The remains are what? The remains are what remains after life leaves or separates the body. After that, all that's left is a body. And Jesus uses this same imagery um, to speak to us today relative to his church. If the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit is gone out of the church, 
then all you have is what remains. You know, you have the potential for a church, right? Because there's a body. But you don't have a church without the Holy Spirit of God. You know, just like in a dead body, you have the, you have the potential for life, but you don't have life because he or she is dead, right? That person can't enjoy the senses of life, the sensations of life. They can't talk or taste or touch or feel. Or, you know why? Because they're dead. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, 14 says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit, for they are foolish, their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. In other words, the human heart, the human heart apart from the Spirit of God is totally incapable uh, of receiving, of processing, of comprehending, of, of sensing things of the Spirit. We need and have been given the Holy Spirit because without him we are, again, totally incapable of understanding or experiencing anything from the Spirit, anything that God wants, wants to say to us. And, and so what's the takeaway this morning? The takeaway is when the illumination of God's Holy Spirit is resisted or grieved or quenched. And those are the three ways that in Scripture that we're told that we can insulate ourselves from the ministry of God's Holy Spirit. We can resist Him. We can grieve Him. Or we can quench His work in our, in our lives. And when we do, then, well, even though we very well may have the appearance of having it together. You know, we may, we may be able to quote scripture all day long. You know, we may be Bible taught, but we won't be spirit taught. And the two are a world apart. They're a world apart. Here in verse one, Jesus indicates it's the difference between life and death. Because without, without the Holy Spirit, it's just noise. It's, I mean, do you remember before you came to faith in Jesus? Do you remember opening the word? You know, maybe, you know, in a hotel, the Gideon Bible, in, in, in one of those, uh, those nightstands, you open it and, you start, and you just think, oh, man, this is hard to read. <laughs> you know, this is dry reading. But then what happens? The Holy Spirit of God does work in your heart. And then he illuminates God's word and it becomes exciting because you sense that God is speaking and making application from, from, from these pages into your very heart, you become alive in the spirit. You know, it's only the spirit of God that gives life. And without the illumination of God's Holy Spirit, without the Holy Spirit, we are likewise spiritually dead. You know, that's, that's clarity there. We're spiritually dead. Jesus goes on to say what? Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Okay, they're works. But are they perfect works? No. So why should Sardis be watchful? Well, because just as their city historically fell, when they weren't watching when they were kind of full of themselves, when they were resting on their laurels, when they were resting upon, you know, uh, an experience that they once had, 
you know, I often think back of, of when I believe I, I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. And, and just the setting and the smells and the sounds and just everything. I mean, it still sends chills up my spine. But if I'm resting on that, that happened, you know, 30, maybe 40 years ago, then I am woefully, in, you know, missing the point here. Because God is not a God of yesterday, yesterday but of today and forever. And he desires to move within our hearts. You know, these were saying, you know, it's all good. We're good. We're good in Sardis. You know, we've got nothing to worry about. You know, we're, we're in this fortress, you know. But Jesus says what? To the church of Sardis, he says, look. He says, look to your own history. <laughs> look to your own history. Your own history should tell you the consequence of that way of thinking. The consequence of that arrogance, you know, resting on what was rather than what is. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? What did he say to you this morning? He's a God that wants to speak to our hearts continually. And so Jesus exhorts this church to what? To be watchful. To be watchful. The word watchful, it's an interesting word. It, it, it literally means to take heed lest through prideful laziness some calamity should come upon you, right? In other words, wake up to those things that threaten your spiritual well-being, You've become nose blind or hard hearted or, you know, blind to the things of God in your own spiritual condition relative to what God would do. So what, what's needed? What's needed? You know, what do we need? <laughs> we need a humble heart. We need a humble heart, a watchful heart, a listening heart a spiritually attentive heart. In other words, a quickened heart that's attentive to what? That's attentive to what? To the things of God. And, and right there, right there is, is a word for us today here in December of 2020. As 2020 leaves, praise God, it's leaving but who knows what, what's to happen in 21, right? You know, there's so much noise. You know, there's so many people flapping their gums, telling us, you know, telling us, you know, in whom or, or, or in what to trust. You know, we're, we're, what are we going to trust in? Science? <laughs> you know, a, a, a vaccine? You know, what are you going to trust in? And I believe all the while the Lord is saying, like, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to get your attention? I love you this much. What do I have to do to get through? It's high time to tune in. It's high time to quiet our hearts and to get on our faces and start listening on our faces and listening. You know, that is a position, that is a, a, a posture of power, of power. Abraham, you know, just going through Abraham and, and Genesis 17 and Moses and number 16, Joshua on his face before the Lord in uh, Joshua chapter 5 and 7. You know, Ezekiel and Daniel and, and Ezra and Nehemiah and King David on their faces before God. And when they were, great things happened. You know, even Jesus himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. You can read about it in Matthew 26, humbling himself. Humbling himself and listening. Listening to his father. And, and 
and being conflicted in his humanity, being conflicted. But yet what? Listening to his father, going to his father and choosing obedience. That's what Jesus did as he humbled himself in the garden of Gethsemane. You know, he chose obedience. Scripture tells us even unto death. Obedience even unto death. Even death on the cross. On their faces, listening before God. You know, there's probably no better picture. No better picture. It's the right place. It's our rightful place. It's God's church. It's our rightful place, and it's the right place for God. God on his throne, you know, speaking truth to his people, and the church on their faces listening. When a person is in relationship with God, that's the way it's got to be. That's the way it's got to be if a person isn't willing to assume a listening attitude. You know, a humbling of heart. You know, no matter what your posture, but on spiritually, on your face before God. Then there's going to be no real hearing from God. No meeting from God. No living in the experience of God where the Lord is, is desiring to do what he purposes to do, speak truth in life. That's what he wants to do. That's what he wants to do in his word. He wants to speak truth and life into our hearts. So what was it that was heard and received? Uh, Well, it was the word of God. Jesus says, remember therefore how you have received and heard, verse 3, hold fast and repent. You know, it was God's word that, that they had received and heard. And the Lord says, you know what? Hold fast. Let it take effect. When you're holding something fast, close to you, you are going to experience it. And that's what Jesus, that's the picture he paints here. Hold fast. And allow it to do its work. Allow that conviction of heart leading to repentance. Historically, it, it's what, what the Reformation was all about when you think about it, right? In fact, you know, we can think of, as we consider, and if you study, and it's a, it's a study worth, um, worth delving into, you know, if you study the, all the great revivals throughout the ages, you know, they were all about what? How, how did they come about? They came about humbling our hearts and getting back to God's word, getting back to what God has to say, right? With regard to this historic, you know, consideration uh, of the Reformation, you know, the age, in that day and age of medieval Catholicism, you know, things had become so dark, so much corruption, you know, Uh, the uh, Pope Sergius III, you know, in 904 through 967, you know, he brought in what history calls the uh, rule of the harlots, you know, during during his reign as Pope, um, he publicly accompanied his mistress into the papal palace. You know, Sergius's grandson, John X, he continued this, this legacy a- until he was actually killed in his bedroom committing adultery. And then came Pope Benedict the Ninth, bringing in the practice of simony. Simony was uh, the practice of actually purchasing uh, offices within the church uh, to the highest bidder. Um, and, uh, and from there, it just went on and on. Um, times were so dark. It was such a dark time, which caused some stirring in the hearts 
some good Catholics in that day, right? Uh, men like Wycliffe, again, Calvin and Knox and, and Luther, who got on their faces again before God and it enabled them, it gave them the boldness to stand up and say, enough, enough is enough. We are only here in this predicament because we've strayed away from what God has to say in his word. It, it was essentially taking heed to Jesus' word here in verse 3. Remember, therefore, how you've received and heard, hold fast and repent. In other words, again, it's time to get back to basics. Get back to the word of God. Jesus, he continues in verse 3, therefore, if you will not watch, in other words, if you will not humble yourself and, and listen, I will come to you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I come upon you. Jesus says here, if you don't get back to, if you don't repent, I'm going to come to you as a thief. You know, and, and this is what uh, uh, mainline denominationalism, you know, um, experiences and, and many outside of mainline denominationalism right uh, many don't believe in in the rapture of the church they don't believe in the millennium uh, they teach that the promises uh, of of the kingdom the sayings of isaiah the teachings of revelation they're all allegorical all of this is allegorical it's not to be taken literally and, and, and thus they're what they're going to be totally caught off guard by Jesus' return. Jesus continues with a word of encouragement. He says, you have a few names. Even there in Sardis, you have a few names who have not defiled their garments, who have not bought into this, and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. They are worthy to put on the righteousness of God because they put on the righteousness of God. Verse 5, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. In other words, those in Thard, um, Sardis are um, this epic, you know, uh, of church history or even today, the church today, who stay true to what? Who stay true to what? Who stay true to God's word will overcome. We will be overcomers Jesus continuing and I will not blot out his name from the book of life but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels and I believe there's a lot of confusion you know over these words here well what do you mean blot out his name out of the book of life uh, you know that sounds a lot like there's a possibility of uh, one losing their salvation. Isn't that the way it appears? What the Lord is simply saying here, that it's a given. It is a given that the, na that the names that are written in the book of life will not be blot out. They will not, it, it's the assurance, it does just the opposite as some, some perceive. It's assurance of salvation. Once your name is in the book of life, it is in the book of life. And the Lord says, and I'm going to confess his name before my father and his angels here. An unmistakable reference to what? To eternity future of what awaits all of humanity. You know, Jesus says in, in, in Luke 8 and 9, he says, also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him, my father, or, I'm sorry. And I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him, the son of man, will confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me for men, before men will be, nied, be denied before the angels of God. <laughs> you know, he's simply saying that those who, you know, as we're told, in Romans chapter 10, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, then what? Then we will be saved and our names will be in the book of life. 
Jesus concludes, he who has an ear. He who has an ear. And again, we have two ears, right? <laughs> he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says, is saying presently to the churches and to the church and to us this morning. And so the question is for us, are we listening? Am I listening? Am I just, you know, regurgitating what the Lord's given me in this study? Am I taking to heart these words for myself? And are, are we, as God's church here, in, in this place, in Dixon, are we listening? Am I a listening pastor? Are we do we have a listening leadership? Do we have a listening church? The message um, to us. It, it can all be summed up in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed. Lest he fall. Lest he fall away from the blessing that's promised to us this morning. It's essentially a call for what? A call for self-examination, to be watchful, to be as the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Therefore, what? Therefore, we are what? We're a post. Our faith is a post. There are forces of darkness that oppose what God would do in and through his church. And, and the enemy would like nothing more to lull a church into lethargy, into sleepfulness. But the Lord, against this backdrop of Sardis, who did that, said, wake up. Wake up, church. Wake up, Christian." And therefore, heed what? Heed our present spiritual condition. Heed what the Lord would say to us, his church, this morning. Man, I, I really hope these aren't just words this morning. I hope this isn't just a study. I think it's, it's time for us all. You know, to, and it's a healthy thing. It's a healthy thing for a church to take inventory. It's a healthy thing to say, Lord, is this me? Lord, is this our church? Is it the church at large? Is this who we are? Lord, give us hearts to receive the infusing of your Holy Spirit, God, that we may be the church who you are have called us to be, made up of the Christians who you have called us to be. Let's pray. Father, quiet our hearts this morning and give us pause, Father. Lord, to take these words to heart, Lord, that we would take inventory. Father, that uh, we might look inward Father, in that you would, Father, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, Father. You know, that we wouldn't just say, man, Lord, send a revival. Like, uh, send a revival, you know, I'll go home and watch uh, a football game, but you go ahead and send a revival. Lord, that we wouldn't be Sardis-like, but Lord, that we would be men and woman, women who would humble our hearts and say, Lord, you know, how would you use me? How would you change things in my life? What do I need to change? What patterns have I developed that, uh, that only insulate me, that only makes me more Sardis-like? Father, help us to take heed through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit as we take inventory and as you speak truth and conviction to our souls, to our lives. Help us to take heed in Jesus' name.
And we all said, amen. God bless you guys.